أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون أياما معدودات فمن كان منكم مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر وعلى الذين يطيقونه فدية طعام مسكين ومن تطوع خيرا فهو خير له وأن تصوموا خير لكم إن كنتم تعلمون شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان فمن شهد منكم الشهر فليصمه ومن كان مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر يريد الله بكم اليسر ولا يريد بكم العسر ولتكملوا العدة ولتكبروا الله على ما هداكم ولعلكم تشكرون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله I was asked uh, today to speak about sort of an introductory dars on the coming of Ramadan all of you know and all of us are excited about the approaching of Ramadan and I pray that Allah helps us witness this month once again and that all of our ibadat before then and especially during then are accepted by Allah Azza wa Jal and I pray that every single one of us and every single one of our family members is able to find Laylatul Qadr this, uh, this year, inshaAllah ta'ala. So I want to uh, share with you some reflections about the way the Qur'an talks about Ramadan. And there are a few things all of us have to know. Allah only talks about Ramadan once. Allah talks about taqwa many times. Allah talks about akhirah many times. Allah talks about different prophets many times. Allah talks about different ahkam many times, but when it came to Ramadan, there's only one place, that's it. There's no repetition, it's not mentioned anywhere else. And that is in Surah Al-Baqarah, many of you already know that. But the place in which it is in Baqarah is important to note. You know, the first half of Surah Al-Baqarah is Allah giving reasons to Bani Israel why they are not the chosen Ummah anymore. What mistakes did they make? Allah made a list of them in Surah Al-Baqarah. At the end of that list, he talked about Ibrahim alayhi salam. Why? Because Ibrahim alayhi salam is the link between the Arabs and the Jews. Why is he the link between the Arabs and the Jews? The Arabs are children of Ismail and the Jews are children of Ishaq. So that the, the common bond between them is the grandfather, which is Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam is, they're reminded of Ibrahim alayhi salam because they say we will only accept a prophet if it comes from our ancestry. And by our ancestry, they mean the children of Ishaq. And Allah reminds them, why are you obsessed with the children of Ishaq and you don't care about the children of Ibrahim alayhi salam? Because Ibrahim alayhi salam also is the father of Ismail and through him Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So the idea was that this, this chosen ummah is the children of Ibrahim. And it used to be through the lineage of Ishaq, and now it's through the lineage of Ismail alayhi salam. But at the end of the day, they're still all what? Children of Ibrahim. So there's not a change. This is not really a change. So they are told after they're given all the reasons why they will not be given Risala anymore, then they are reminded of Ibrahim alayhi salam, and the story that is mentioned of Ibrahim alayhi salam is وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُوا إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلِ رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ When Ibrahim alayhi salam was building the foundations of the Kaaba, that is mentioned now at the end of this first half of Surah Al-Baqarah. Why is that important? Because the Kaaba that Allah just ashara ilayha, He just hinted at it that He's building the Ibrahim alayhi salam built the Kaaba. A few ayat later, you know what's going to happen? Allah will command the Muslims that they should not pray towards Al Masjid Al Aqsa. They should pray towards Al-Masjid Al-Haram. They should pray towards the Kaaba. 
But before he told the Muslims they should pray towards the Kaaba, he mentioned that Ibrahim is the one who built it. Why? Because the Jews and us, Muslims, until then, we used to pray in what direction? Al-Aqsa. We prayed in the same direction as them. We prayed in the same direction. Until the ayat came and now the Muslims were commanded to pray in the direction of Al-Kaaba. Now, you should know also that when the Prophet ﷺ was in Mecca, it is possible to face the Qibla and at the same time face Al-Aqsa. You can stand in one part of the Qibla and when you're facing the Haram, you're also facing Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, it's possible. But when you go to Medina, you don't have that option anymore. Either you will face the Kaaba or you will turn your back to the Kaaba and face Al-Aqsa. You cannot face both at the same time anymore. When Rasulullah was in Mecca, he was able to face both of them. When he's in Medina, he can only face one of them. And he was facing Al-Aqsa. And it hurt him. He didn't like, he missed facing the Kaaba. That's why Allah even mentions that in the Quran. When the Tahweel Al-Qibla, the ayat of the change of the Qibla are mentioned. That's why Allah says, قَدْ نَرَى تَقَلُّبَ وَجْهِكَ فِي السَّمَاءِ فَلَنُوَلِّيَنَّكَ قِبْلَةً تَرْضَاهَا We saw your face turning to the sky, so we're turning the Qibla, Allah says. But anyway, the point I want to make is, a nation, and please listen to this carefully, a nation is known by its capital. When you have a nation, you have to have a capital, okay? And especially if you are a big nation, then you have to have a respected capital, and the capital is part of your identity. You know, if one city in a country falls to the enemy, the enemy takes over one city or one village or one town, no big deal. When is the country completely defeated? When you take over the capital. When you take over the capital, that country is no more. Okay, so the, the capital represents the identity of a nation. The Qibla for the Muslims is our identity, it's our capital. Mecca is our is Islamic capital. We all face in its direction. When Allah changed the direction of the Qibla, He changed our identity. He changed our identity. Now the Jews of that time, interestingly enough, Allah wants us to become a separate nation, yes? That's why He, ch he changed our capital. And as soon as He changed our capital, He says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطَى After He changed the capital, He says, that is how we made you a middle nation. He inaugurated us as a new nation now. Because now we have our own capital. The other thing that's important to know, this is a conversation especially where I come from, because I talk to Christians and Jews a lot, where I come from in Texas. Allah Azza wa Jal teaches us in the Quran that the Jews did not like when the, Kaaba, the Qibla was changed. They didn't like it. The question arises, why didn't they like it? I mean, do any of you have non-Muslim friends? If you do, if you have a Christian friend, or you have a Jewish friend, or you have a Hindu friend, or you have a Buddhist friend, whether you pray this way or that way or that way, do they care? They don't care. They, it doesn't matter to them. If the Jews are a separate religion, they're a separate religion. If the Muslims are praying towards Qibla or they're not praying towards Qibla, if they're praying towards Aqsa or they're not praying towards Aqsa, they shouldn't care. But Allah says, سَيَقُولُ السُّفَهَاءُ مِنَ النَّاسِ مَا وَاللَّهُ مَعَنْ قِبْلَتِهِمْ الَّتِي كَانُوا عَلَيْهَا the idiots among the people are going to say, how come they turned away? How, what turned them away from the Qibla they used to be on? How come they changed their direction? In other words, the Jews were offended. The Jews of Medina were offended. Why were they offended? Because deep down inside, they knew that so long as they're praying towards that direction, that is still the capital, which means we are still part of the accepted people. But as soon as the direction changes, that means we no longer have our capital, we have to accept this as the capital, which means we have to accept the children of Ibrahim and Ismail. We cannot no longer hold on to our identity. Our supremacy is gone in the sight of Allah. And this proved that they believed in the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَأَهُمْ They know him like they know their own kids. They knew he's the Messenger of Allah and that's why they were offended. And they, by being offended, proved that deep down inside they had accepted him as the messenger, were still refusing. And that's what makes them fools. Sayaqulu sufaha. The fool gives up his secret. <laughs> so Allah says, the fools will say what turned them away from the qibla. You understand? So the first thing that made us a separate ummah was the change of qibla. There's an official. We used to, by the way, we used to fast on the same days as the Jews. We used to pray in the same direction as the Jews. 
And we, before the five prayers, we had the same awqat as salat, the same times of prayer as the Jews. Why? Because it was the sharia of Musa alayhi salam, until new sharia comes, we, we adopt the sharia that was given before us. The Prophet ﷺ adopted all of the things from the Sharia of Musa until Allah gave him his own Sharia. All of it was maintained. Now, we used to fast the same days as the Jews. Ayat came down. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu kutiba alaykum siyam. Those of you who have iman, fasting has been made mandatory upon you. Okay? Kama kutiba alaylladheena min qablikum. Just like it was made mandatory upon the people who came much before you. Who are those people? Who had fasting as a fard on them, the Jews, Banu Israel, the Israelites, the Sharia of Musa alayhi salam. So even Allah is saying part of your identity is the same as the identity of the Jews. But in the same surah already he separated us from them by separating our Kaaba. He separated them. But now he's saying we have something in common with them, which is what? Fasting. Fasting is the same between us and them. Then he says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you can have taqwa. You people can have taqwa. Now it's interesting that in the first half of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah talked about who again? If you were paying attention, who does Allah talk about? The Jews. And Allah complains the entire time, why don't you have taqwa? The entire time the problem is they have no taqwa. And now Allah says, you are given the same exercise as them. Which is what? Fasting. And what's the point of all of it? So you can have Taqwa. So let's, the first conversation I want to have with you was that fasting is something we have in common with the previous nation. But why do we fast? Why do we fast? Is also the same. Why they fasted was to get taqwa. Why we fast is also to get taqwa. I want to talk to you practically what does that mean? Taqwa is, you know, the, the, people translate that as the fear of Allah. Taqwa comes from the word wiqaya. Wiqaya actually means protection. Taqwa is similar to ittiqa, to seek protection, to try to protect yourself. That's why on judgment day, on judgment day, everybody will try to protect themselves. So Allah says, وَكَيْفَ تَتَّقُونَ إِنْ كَفَرْتُمْ يَوْمًا يَجْعَلُ الْوِلْدَانَ شِيبًا How will you protect yourself on the day if you disbelieved? The day on which a baby's hair is going to turn gray. So he uses the word tattaqoon to describe protecting yourself. That's what the real meaning of taqwa is, to protect yourself. Allah says, Allah gave you fasting so you can protect yourself. And what does that mean? Let's, let's try to understand what that means. Human beings, us, we have certain training. You have to go through training if you want to get good at something. Especially physical training. Like if somebody is, they want to become a soldier, or they want to become a police officer, then they have to go through certain kinds of training. And their body learns to adapt. Like at, at the beginning it's hard, and then it gets easier and easier and easier for them, right? And this idea of training, putting yourself in difficulty, it helps you in not... Well, by the way, when you're in training, things are easy. When you're in the training program, things are easy. Like for example, when they train firemen, they set up a fire to put it out, but they control the fire. It's not like a real fire in a building. It's controlled, so it's easier. They make you jump down a building, but it's easier. It's not like the real thing. They go easy on you, and then they, when you get good enough, then they put you in the real life situation. You understand that, right? Now the same thing happens with fasting. Fasting, you're constantly feeling something, aren't you? Especially in Qatar. Especially in the Khalij. You're constantly feeling thirst. You're constantly feeling hunger. There is not a minute that goes by that you're not feeling it. Your, your throat is fighting with you. Your lungs are fighting with you. Your, your throat is yelling at you and saying, give me water, give me water, give me water. Whether you like it or not, your throat is begging you. And you tell your throat, shut up throat, it's not maghrib yet. Your stomach starts talking to you, sometimes very loudly. Hey man, come on, what's going on up there? Where's the supply, <laughs> you know? And you're like, it's fajr dude, you're, are you starting already, you know? You have a conversation with yourself. But you know what? There's a war going on inside you when you're fasting. There's a war, physical war going on inside you. Your throat is against you. Your stomach is against you. Your body is getting weaker and begging you, please disobey Allah. Please disobey Allah. And you stay the entire day fasting, fighting your body and you say, no, my heart is submitted to Allah and therefore I don't care if my entire body wants something, I will not give it to it. 
you train your heart to control your body. That's what you do when you fast. That's what I do when I fast. Why is that important? Because when the fasting is over, you have to continue to train your... Now your heart is ready to control your body. So you're not just going to eat what you want. You're not just going to go where you want. You're not just going to look at what you want. Because all of those things your body wants. But who has gotten stronger when you fast? The body got weaker and who got stronger? The heart got stronger. And where does taqwa rest? إِنَّ ذَلِكَ مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ the, the heart is the place of taqwa. When you give your body the, the weakness, and you give your heart the strength, you train yourself to stop yourself from other things. So my, my dear young brother, the young guys that are here, if you're fasting, staying at home and watching movies, you're not fasting. You're not fasting. Because you're still, your heart is still giving in to your, the, the wrong temptations. The entire exercise of fasting is you constantly remember, yeah, just like I'm fighting my stomach, just like I'm fighting my throat, I gotta fight my eyes. I gotta fight my, I gotta fight my mouth. I gotta fight my tongue. I gotta fight my, my desires. I gotta fight my hormones. I have a fight with everything now. The, the thing we see is the drinking and the, 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 you know, the, the eating. But everything else, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ If we don't remember this, then we become just like Banu Israel. They fasted, but they didn't have what? They didn't have taqwa. Man, they didn't have taqwa, but they fasted. If you forget why you're given the fast, then you're just doing what Bani Israel did. Allah said to you, Kutiba alaykum as-siyam, alaykum muqaddam. This is called maf'ul jar majroon muqaddam. Especially on you, I'm, it's your turn now. I am giving you what I gave to them. They did not benefit from fasting. They didn't get taqwa. Hopefully you will get taqwa. That's what Allah is saying. That's what Allah is saying when He gave us fasting. What is the first thing people think of when they think of fasting? They think of iftar. <laughs> they think of iftar. Fasting is your training for real life. And by the way, I told you when training goes on, when training goes on, then it's easier. Controlled fire. Controlled situations. What does Allah do? Does Allah make fasting in Ramadan easier? Does He cage up shaitan? Does He put the shaitan away? He does, doesn't He? He's going easy on you. So your heart can get a chance to train and get better without being in the battlefield. The second Ramadan is over, Eid Mubarak, guess what? Shaitan is out. And the war begins. And all of that training will now come in handy. But if you didn't train yourself properly, eh. Look, uh, I mean, just to help the younger guys here, this is for the younger guys especially. If a guy wants to join the army, he has to go through physical training. So they make the guy jump over a wall or climb a wall and go on the other side. So two guys join the military. One of them jumps over the wall, the other one goes around the wall. They both got to the other side. You have to do it ten times. One guy jumps over it ten times, the other guy walks over it ten times. Right? Now when they're on the battlefield and they have to go over a wall, Who's going to go and who's going to fail? You understand? They both can say, I did it, I made it to the finish line. But that's what you wanted, to reach the finish line. I did it. You will fast and your brother will fast, but your fasting will not be the same. It won't be the same. The guy who applied himself and actually trained himself and the guy who didn't train himself, they're not going to get the same results. Now let's move on. Allah says, Ayyama ma'dudat. Ayyama ma'dudat, which means very few days. You know what that means? The ayah I just talked to you about is not about Ramadan. This is not Ramadan yet. The word ma'dudat in Arabic grammar, they call this jam'u qillah, which means less than 10, nine or less. Nine or less. Which means this ayah is about the old fasting. The fasting before Ramadan, which was on the same days as the Jews. Or the, you know, the middle three days of the month and all of that. Few days. Allah says, I've made fasting mandatory on you just like the old nation. Meaning, just like them, same days as them. أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودًا فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرْ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرْ If you're, if any of you is sick, or you're traveling, then you can make it up later. وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ طَعَامُ مِسْكِينَ And the people who don't have the ability to do that, they don't, they can't make it up, then they can feed a poor person. So now I'm going to remind you, so you pay attention. There are two things you can do if you miss the fast. This is before Ramadan. 
What did Allah tell the Muslims? There's two things you can do. What are the two things? You tell me. What's the first thing? No, if you, may, if you miss the fast, what can you do? You can make it up. You can make it up. What's the second thing you can do? Feed the poor. It's two options. There's two ways you can fix it. Two ways to fix it. Remember that. Two ways to fix it. But two ways to fix it before Ramadan or after Ramadan? No, 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 no. This is before Ramadan came down. These ayat are not about Ramadan. These ayat are... Muslims didn't know about Ramadan yet. They just knew about the fasting like the fasting of the Jews. And if you fast those few days and you miss them, you can make it up or you can feed a poor person. Okay. Then Allah says, وَمَن تَطَوَّعَ خَيْرًا فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَهُ Now if you give a poor person sadaqah, or you feed a poor person, or you volunteer to make up the day, Allah says, if you volunteer to make up the day, it's better for you. It's better. Even though I'm giving you both options, you should make it up. Okay? But it's not, you're not sinful if you feed the poor person. This is what the Sahaba had. Okay. وَأَن تَصُومُوا خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ If you fast, it's better for you. If you knew, fine. Now Allah talks about Ramadan. So I want you to understand the history first. When the Muslims first heard about fasting, the Sahaba heard about fasting, radiallahu anhu ajma'een, it was less than 10 days. Number one. There were two, day, two ways to get out of it. Number two. And even if you want to volunteer, you can make it up. But you have the option. You have the option. Okay. Now Allah says, Shahru Ramadan. The month of Ramadan. This is the next ayah. This is the only ayah actually about the fasting of Ramadan in the Quran. This is the one. الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ Now listen, I told you, when people think of Ramadan, what's the first thing that comes in their head? Iftar, pakore, samose, make sure you have enough ketchup in the house, you know. You go extra shopping for all the sodas and all things. People, Muslims usually, they, they don't lose weight in Ramadan, we gain weight in Ramadan. <laughs> right? That's our practice. Even fasting, even if you, when you think of Ramadan, the first thing you think of is fasting. If you don't think of the food, at least you think of fasting. Or you say, man, Ramadan this year is coming in the summer. Oh, it's going to be hard. That's the thought that goes in your head. Allah says in the Quran, the first thing you should think about when you hear the word Ramadan, Shahru Ramadan, الذي unzila fihi al-Quran. Not الَّذِي كُتِبَ فِيهِ الصِّيَامِ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ The month in which Qur'an came down. Ramadan, the month in which the Qur'an came down. The thing that makes Ramadan special is not the fasting. The thing that makes Ramadan special is the Qur'an. That is Allah telling us. That is Allah telling us. Now you have to ask yourself, if you are fasting in Ramadan, but you don't recite any Qur'an, you're fasting in Ramadan, but you didn't memorize not even one page, the whole 30 days. Not even half a page, not even two ayahs. You didn't memorize anything in Quran, from the Quran. Then how, would, how do you understand what Allah is saying? The entire purpose of Ramadan is to celebrate the Quran. I told you, the first thing you need for a nation is a capital. What's the new capital? Kaaba. The second thing you need for a nation is a constitution. What's the constitution? Quran. And when the constitution is written and passed, then every nation celebrates. Every nation that has a constitution has a constitution day. The day on which their constitution was implemented. They have that day. Okay? Our constitution is celebrated, it was revealed in the month of Ramadan. Allah didn't give us one day to celebrate. He gave us 30 days to celebrate the coming of the Quran. This is, the month of Ramadan is the celebration of the fact that Allah made us an ummah. Now we have our own capital, and we have our own constitution, and we have our own days of fasting. No longer the same as the days of the Jews. No more ayyam al-ma'dudat. Now it's shahar Ramadan. They did not have shahar Ramadan. So Allah distinguished us from the previous nation now completely. Now it's done. Now if you want to be, you want to consider yourself, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, you got to change the direction you pray, and you got to change the days you fast. You don't have the option. You know, before they were told, وَرْكَعُوا مَعَ الرَّاكِعِينَ They were told you can make ruku' with those who make ruku' and they might not have had a problem with that. Why? Because it's still in the same direction, but now it's changed. It's gone now. By the way, on a side note, recently I made friends with a rabbi in, back in Texas. 
And I, you know, he's a research scholar in Judaic studies. And I talked to him about Musa alayhi salam and other things. We talk about other. So I asked him one day, when you guys pray, do you have, do you have ruku'? The Quran says about the Jews, warka'u ma'al raki'in. He didn't say, wasjudu ma'al sajideen, sallu ma'al musalleen. He said, warka'u ma'al raki'in. So I said, how come Allah said that to the Jews? Let me ask if you have ruku'. I mean, I know they have sajda, they have ruku'. I said, they said, we have some ruku'. We do it once a year. We used to have it all the time. And I said, do you have sujood? And he said, yeah, we did have sajda. We did put our head on the ground. But we have a prayer now in which we complain about how we don't do it anymore. <laughs> yeah, salam. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's their, I mean, that's, I'm not, I didn't make this up. He told me this as a rabbi telling me this stuff. You know? So they, they lost the sajda and they have something from the ruku' left. So Allah told them, warka'u ma'ar raki'in. And he also told me with their, in their prayer, actually, the final part is ruku'ah. That the ruku'ah comes after and the sajda comes before, for their prayer, right? If they do make sajda, they make it first and they make ruku'ah later. And when Allah was talking to Maryam salamun alayha, he said, wasjudi warka'i. Right? He told her, make sajda, make ruku'ah, because in their sharia, sajda came first and ruku'ah came second. So he, it's appropriate to the ayah. But anyway, coming back to our subject in the, in the month of Ramadan. Shahru Ramadan, الذي أنزل فيه القرآن Then he says, هُدَى للناس This part of the ayah is a slap in the face. He says, Quran is guidance for all people. This ayah is not just to the Muslims. It's also to the Jewish community of Medina. They believe that when wahi comes, it comes for who? Just themselves. It just themselves. Allah says, no. You are not going to this time. This wahi is not just for you. It is for all people. Hudan lil nas. He didn't even say Hudan lil Arab. Hudan li bani Israel. Hudan li bani Ismail. Hudan li bani Ibrahim. No, 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 no. Hudan lil nas. This guidance for all people. This is one of the most beautiful things about our religion, folks. It is one of the most beautiful things about our religion. I don't care if you go into a masjid in America or Australia or the Khalij or Pakistan, if there are multiple nationalities, multiple nationalities, standing in one row, you don't make a distinction, the rich people should be in the first row, middle class should be in the second row, the janitor should be in the third row, nope, nope. Everybody stands in the same row. And it could be that the boss and the worker are standing together. And it could be that the worker is in the first row and the boss is in the last row. That could be too. It could be that the guy who works for you is leading prayer and you're praying behind him. That could be too. It, Allah made this guidance for all people. You know what that means? He made all human beings equal. Just by Quran, by the institution of Salat. We cannot be racist because we have Salat. We cannot be supremacist. We cannot think my nation is better than your nation. My nationality is better than your nationality. My language is better than your language. My skin color is better than your skin color. My village is better than your village. We can't do it. And you know when we are reminded that we can't do that? When we stand together in Salat. When Bilal radiallahu anhu is standing next to Uthman radiallahu anhu, we are reminded that we're equal. This is hudan lil nas. That's what that means. You know why I'm highlighting that? Because I notice it in Muslims. I notice asabiyah in Muslims. I notice Muslims make fun of other nationalities, look down on them, talk bad about them, talk bad about people that speak a different language. The, the, the Arabi makes fun of the non-Arabi. The Bangladeshi makes fun of the Pakistani. The Pakistani makes fun of the Indian. The Filipino makes fun of the Malaysian. What's going on here? Don't we make Salat? Don't we make Salat? Because if that's what our, if we're not learning from our Salat, if we're not learning from this Quran, then we're just, it's like, I, I tell you, we're just a shell. You know, if you have a shell and you don't have any egg inside, that's what our Islam is sometimes. It's just, a, you look like Muslim, you say the words that Muslims say, but inside your heart, there's no, there's no love for your deen. Every one of us here that are sitting in this audience, so many different countries are sitting in this audience right now. It's such an international gathering right here. This is a United Nations meeting right now, you know. Let me tell you, I don't know your name. Some of, some of you know my name, I don't know your name. But you know what, we have a relationship with each other that is thicker than blood. It is thicker than blood just because of La ilaha illallah, just because of that. This Qur'an binds us together. And this was told to the Jews, you know why? Because the Jews believed they were special. Everybody else is second class, we're first class. Everybody else is Gentiles. 
We're the chosen nation. Allah says anybody can become people of Qur'an. Hudan lin nas, open invitation to humanity. That eradicates racism, nationalism, tribalism, egotism. It gets rid of these things. SubhanAllah, what an amazing religion. This is such an incredible thing. Even in America, I can tell you, there are black churches, there are Spanish churches, there are Greek churches, even of the same denomination. And then in the, in the heart of Brooklyn, you're going to have, in New York, in Brooklyn, you'll have different churches, different ethnicities. You walk into the masjid, it's an international conference again. All the same ethnicities standing together. They don't even speak each other's language, but they're praying together. The same Qur'an unifies us. Because when we stand in Salat, what are we listening to? It's Qur'an. Hudal lin nas. Wa bayyinatim min al huda. And there are multiple proofs, clear evidences from guidance. Allah took, this ayah was supposed to be about Ramadan. لِأَنَّهَا بَدَأَتْ بِكَلِمَةْ شَهْرُ Ramadan. The ayah began with شَهْرُ Ramadan. But so far he says, Qur'an came down in it. It's a guidance for people. It's got multiple pre proofs from the guidance. Meaning the, the guidance itself has miracles. That if you look at them, you will know this can only be the word of Allah. بَيِّنَاتٍ مِنَ الْهُدَى furqan. And it distinguishes between right and wrong. All of this up until now, Allah didn't say anything about Ramadan. What's He only talking about? Qur'an. More than half this ayah is about Qur'an. <laughs> Why is He doing that? Because He wants to make sure no Muslim ever forgets that Ramadan is about the Qur'an. Ramadan is about the Qur'an. It's about the miracle of this book. I told you I made friends with who? A rabbi, huh? Let me tell you a fun story about the rabbi. So rabbis, of course, which prophet do they love the most? Musa alayhi So we talk about Musa alayhi salam. He and I, we talk about Musa alayhi salam. We disagree on everything. But we talk about Musa alayhi salam. And I don't talk to him to insult him. I want to understand his position. I would really like to know about Bani Israel from Bani Israel. <laughs> I would really like to know. Because Quran talks to them so much. Ya Bani Israel. Ya Bani Israel. It talks about their prophets so much, they became our prophets. So much. So I want to know what you guys think. So we talk about Musa alayhi salam. And one time I told him, one of the great miracles of the Qur'an, if you don't know, is the name Musa. The name Musa. I said, so what does Musa mean? And they don't say Musa in Hebrew, they say Mushe. So Torah to Musa, they say Torah to Mushe. That's how they pronounce it. So I said, what does Mushe mean? The word Mu for them is similar to the Arabic word Ma. What does Ma mean? Water. Musa is the one from water. That to them, the one from water. Okay. Now the thing of it is, that means that the word Musa is Hebrew. The word Musa is Hebrew. I told him the word Musa is not Hebrew. It cannot be Hebrew. And he says, why not? Musa alayhi salam is from Bani Israel. He's Hebrew. I was like, listen, where was he born? He tells me Egypt. When he was a baby, where, would, where did he end up? Where did he end up? In the castle of Fir'aun. Who, took, who was in charge of him? Fir'aun. Asiya radiallahu anha. And then the mother came as a servant. So when there's a newborn baby, who will name him? The people in charge or the servant? The people in charge. And the people in charge will name him in the language of the slaves if they're going to raise him as a prince. They will raise him as a prince, yes? They should name him in the language of the slaves or the language of the master. The language of the master. And the language of the master is Egyptian, it's not Hebrew. His name is Egyptian, his name is not Hebrew. But the problem with Egyptian is that the Egyptian language died. The Egyptian language was already dead 3,000 years when Rasulullah came sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nobody knew the Egyptian language. So if somebody asked at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what does Musa mean? Nobody could tell you. Why not? Because the Egyptian language was already dead. We live in fortunate times. We live in times where because of Egyptology, the Egyptian language was revived and translated. The hieroglyphics and the, the phonetics of the Egyptian language have now been translated. So now we can go back to Egyptian and find out what, what means Musa means. But before I tell you what it means, let me tell you an ayah from the Qur'an. Musa alayhi salam came into the castle, his mother, his, his foster mother, the queen, picked him up. She took him to Fir'aun and she said, uh, you know, she said to him, عَسَاءً يَدْفَعَنَا أَوْ نَتَّخِذَهُ وَلَدًا 
maybe he could benefit us or we could take him as a newborn we could take him as what a newborn a newborn the word Musa in Hebrew and in Egyptian means newborn the word Musa in Egyptian means what newborn she came to Fir'aun and said maybe we could take him as a newborn make maybe we could take him as a Musa Quran translated Musa alayhi salam's name into waladan the Quran knows the Egyptian language even when it's dead even when it's dead Quran translates it accurately she must have called him Musa because Musa in, er in Hebrew, Egyptian is newborn and Quran says we should take him as a newborn we should waladan subhanallah like you people don't have what we have we do, I disagree with him on everything and that's part of our identity we have to disagree <laughs> On our Kaaba, on our days of fasting, on our prophets, all of it. All of it. But anyhow, now coming back to this really awesome subject. Allah Azza wa now gave us how many days? 30 days. 30 days of fasting. Now you tell me, was it more days before or less days before? It was less days before. How many ways to get out? What were those two ways to get out? Either you can make it up or Feed the poor. Okay. This time he says, فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا فَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرْ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرْ If you are traveling or sick, you have to make it up. You have to make it up. How many options? One. No option number two. No option number two. So the previous ayah was, you have not 30 days, a few days, less than 10, and you have two ways to get out. Then Ramadan came, and now you don't have three days, or four days, or five days, you have how many? 30 days, and you don't have two ways to get out, now you have only one way to get out. Did things get easier or harder? Things got harder. Things got harder. And as soon as they got harder, Allah says to us, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرِ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرِ Allah wants ease for you, He doesn't want difficulty for you. SubhanAllah, the moment He made it harder, Immediately after making it harder, he said, by the way, I want ease for you. I'm like, Ya Rabbi, you just made it harder. Why are you telling me you want ease for me? How is this easier? This is harder. He's telling us something very powerful. He's telling us something very powerful. The first lesson from this is Allah will give the Muslim the power to fast in Ramadan, that he will make fasting easier in Ramadan than any other time of the year. You, I can guarantee you, when you fast in Ramadan, it will be easier. And the week after you fast in Ramadan, it will be 10 times harder because Allah says He wants ease for you. Those 30 days will be easier than 3 days outside of Ramadan. Subhanallah, that's the first meaning. Yuridullahu bikum wal yusr. Allah wants ease for you. The second thing is if you have 2 days of training, 3 days of training, 4 days of training, you got some training. But if you have 30 days of training, are you stronger? You're stronger. Will that training last longer? It'll last longer. Allah Azza wa Jal gave us 30 days of no shaitan. 30 days of all Quran. 30 days of the heart controlling the body. 30 days of that. He really, really prepared us for this training. And when the training is hard, by the way, when training gets hard, then when you finish it, you get a certificate and you celebrate. You go to people and say, I, finished, I got my certification. People congratulate you, they give you a hug. When we finish our training, what do we have? We have Eid. We celebrate. SubhanAllah, we, can, we can successfully completed this year's training. Why were we given this training? So that we can deal with the real life situation. Now the war with shaitan and yourself begins again. Let's go. Go into the battlefield. But you know what? Even though the fasting is no longer with you every day, what should now go inside you that you never want to let go of? Qur'an. The real weapon you will have against shaitan will be your Qur'an. That's why we, when we recite Qur'an, we ask Allah's refuge first. فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنِ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ You will come out of Ramadan stronger because you will have more Qur'an in your heart. I am telling you guys, brothers, sisters, everybody that's listening here, you have to memorize Qur'an in Ramadan. You, if you've been lazy, stop it. Get started. I don't care if you do two ayat. I don't care if you do two pages. 
Set your goals high. وَمَنْ يَتَهَيَّبْ سُعُودَ الْجِبَالِ يَعِشَ بَيْدَ الدَّهَرْ بَيْنَ الْحُفَرِ Aim high. Aim high. Say I'm going to memorize a whole juz this month. I'm going to memorize 20 pages. I'm going to memorize 10 pages. I'm going to finish the entire, you know, juz amma or something. Aim high, even if you don't finish. But put yourself in that position. When somebody tries to memorize the Qur'an, you're, you know, you go to Fajr at the masjid, and you decide you're going to stay back a couple of hours and you're just going to sit there, or maybe 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and you're just going to memorize Qur'an. I can tell you that is one of the most sincere acts of ibadah you will ever do in your life. Because you're not memorizing Qur'an to show off to anybody else. When you memorize Qur'an, the only one who will know is who? You. Unless you have the problem, you go over, hey, by the way, by the way, I know Surah al Sir. So, you know, <laughs> if you have that problem, then see me later. <laughs> Other than that, if you're memorizing Qur'an, who is it for? Yourself, and you're spending so much time on every ayah And every time you repeat it, the angels are writing it down Because when you memorize, don't you have to repeat yourself? Every time you repeat yourself, the angels are writing it down Every time, every time, every time, every time It's not one time for you, it's ten times for you Twenty times for you per ayah The, 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 the barakat of the Qur'an are entering into your life This is what we have to do when it comes to Ramadan Now, the real reason I came to talk Oh my God, I only have like How much time do I have? Fifteen minutes? I need like an hour. I just need an hour. Can I have an hour? We'll pray Isha and continue to? All right, okay, okay. So this is the part I really want to talk to you about. I'll set the scene for you first. I am the head of a small institute and I have 60 students. In a year, I have 60 students. I teach them for five hours every day. When I finish teaching five hours, I'm tired. One student comes to me and says, Ustad, can I have five minutes? I only want five minutes. I say, okay. I give him five minutes. Then another one comes and says, I only want five minutes. Then another one comes and says, I only want five minutes. Then another one, five minutes. Then another one, five minutes. Sixty students come to me. Each one of them says, I only want five minutes. How many minutes? Three hundred minutes. How many hours is that? That's three hours, 300 minutes, MashaAllah, there's a good math program in Qatar. Excellent PhDs in mathematics in the house. Five hours. I was already dead from teaching. Now I'm in the ICU. But each of the students says, man, I only got five minutes. I didn't get any time. There are 500 people sitting in here, maybe more. If I only talk to each of you for one minute, one minute, that's 500 minutes. That's over eight hours. <laughs> that's eight hours of one minute each. And every one of you will say, man, I only got 60 seconds. That wasn't a real conversation. You understand? Let me give you another example. My, one of my daughters had a health problem. And we had to go to a specialist. You don't just go to the regular doctor, you have to go to the specialist. Now the specialist is very busy. You can't just walk into his office. You have to get an appointment. And they give you an appointment three months later. And you say, no, you don't have anything sooner? No, he's booked for three months. What can I do? Okay, and if you miss your appointment, it's nine o'clock. If you show up at 9.05, gone. They have to get another appointment after four months. So if you want to meet important people, you cannot do it on your schedule. You have to do it on their schedule you have to go on their schedule if your boss calls you you don't say when i have time inshallah I'll, you know you go because you're on his schedule he's not on your schedule you're on his you understand that's the nature with important people now with your children that's not the case if you call your child he better show up he's not going to say dad take an appointment i'll get back to you at 8 45 or something you know i'm free then <laughs> no He'll show up, he has to show up right away. You understand? Now, last example. If you have a, a, uh, a, 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 the employer of a company, maybe there's a, comp a CEO, you know, the owner, and he has 500 employees. 500 employees. Does he know all of them? No. He only knows a few managers. And those managers have a few team, and their team has their managers of sub teams and sub teams. So he knows 10 people, 15 people. He doesn't know everyone. He doesn't know everyone. And if everybody sent him a request directly, can he answer them? No. He doesn't even care. 
He doesn't care. Who is this guy? He's the security guard? I don't care. I'm the CEO. Who is this guy? He's just an accountant? I don't care. He's just any employee. Now understand this ayah. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ When my slaves ask you about me, when my slaves ask you about me, then I am near. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِي إِذَا دَعَانَ I respond to the, invite, the call of anybody who calls as the, at the moment they call me. I will not put you on hold. You will not go to voicemail. You will not be told within 24 hours. I will respond whenever you call. Whenever you call. That is not possible for a human being. It's not possible. Even if I love you, I cannot answer you. I love my children. When they're sitting in the back, my four daughters are sitting in the back, and they're all talking at the same time, can I answer them? No. And even if they ask me, one says, I want to eat ice cream, the other says, I want to have pizza, the other says, I want to go home and go to sleep, and the other one says, let's go to the park. I can only do one of those. I can't all answer all of them at the same time. I don't have the ability, even if I love them. I have to say, sorry, I can't. Allah Azza wa Jal says to His Prophet, Alayhi salatu wasalam, when they ask you about me, tell them I am close and I will answer whenever they call. I will answer their dua whenever they call. The, the thing in Ramadan, the secret to Ramadan, it's okay. Children crying should not bother you, by the way. Sister, if your kids are crying, it's okay. Other sisters, stop looking at her. <laughs> stop staring at her, just look, look away. Look at the pretty lights on top or something else, okay? Stop giving her the look of death. Now, if your child is super crazy, then just take a walk and come back. Okay, those are, the, those are my only conditions. We should be happy that mothers come to the program, man. It's hard. If you're complaining, you're hot, well, baby, must be real much hotter. We should be happy they're here. May Allah put barakah in this mother and her child, and their life, and all the children that are here. No, this takes a lot of effort to do that. I know, I have kids. Getting them into the car is jihad fi sabilillah. <laughs> then on top of that... Then on top of that, you got to drive in this traffic, you know, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. One guy has to go to the bathroom, the other one's hungry, the other one fell asleep, and you wake him up and he's cranky, oh my God. You know, it's not like you single guys over here, let's go to the masjid. You know, it's not like that. It ain't like that, bro. You know, and those, and probably the father here recognizes his son's screaming. And if you do, you're like, alhamdulillah, my wife is here, I don't have to hold the baby. <laughs> But the, the, the talk I want to give you guys after Salat is about dua and these ayat. Specifically these ayat, they have so much treasure in them. There are so many gifts from Allah in these ayat that they can't even be counted. But a, a few of them I want to share with you inshaAllah ta'ala. Why? Because, because I want to encourage all of you, this Ramadan should be a month of Qur'an and should be a month of a lot of dua and you can combine both of those things. And inshallah, we'll talk about how you can combine both of those things. ta'ala. Every time you have an option to earn halal money and a more option to earn a lot more money, but it's not exactly halal, then you remind yourself, Wali Allah. Allah is greater than that money. So I'm not going to go there. Every time you're lying down in bed and the adhan is being given for fajr and shaitan is holding you down and you're like, I can't, I can't do it. Just five more minutes, shaitan says to you. And then you say it to yourself, five more minutes. I can catch the first rakah. I can do it, no problem. I'm, a li I'm amazing at waking up whenever I want. And then next thing you know, it's 10 a.m. Right? When that happens, then at that moment, Wali Tukabbirullah, you say, Allah is bigger. Allah is greater than my sleep. Allah is more important than my sleep. That's what this means, to prioritize Allah. Allah is a bigger priority than my own temptation, my own laziness, my own desire, my own urges, my own hunger, my own greed. All of those things are less. Allah is greater. That's the training of Ramadan. And the ayah ends beautifully and so that you can be grateful. Now the question is, grateful for what? The ayah began, Shahru Ramadan, الذي unzila fihi. Al-Qur'an, so the first ni'mah, the first blessing that you and I should be grateful for is what? Al-Qur'an, so you can be appreciative of the Qur'an. Now let me tell you, if I come to your house and I give you a gift, hey, I, I bought this for you, 
I bought some silly crystal thing. Pakistanis like crystal things. So I give you a crystal thing. And you say, oh, this is so beautiful. Thank you. In front of me. Is that insulting? I gave you a gift and in front of me, what did you do? You say you thanked me, but you threw it away. Or I say, hey, I bought you this book. I thought you would like it. I say, oh, thanks so much. And you take a piece of cloth and you wrap it up. And you put it behind the fridge. I didn't give you a book. So you can wrap it up and put it behind the fridge. I, why did I give you a book? So you read it. You're not grateful for this gift. You understand? Allah says, so you can be grateful. Meaning you appreciate the Quran like you never did before. Once Ramadan is over, it's like you found this new relationship with this book. You can't put it down. You're all, you always want to know more about it. You always want to recite it more. Allah has given us a direct link to Him. No other religion has this. No other religion has this. What we experience in Salat is a direct link to Allah. Literally, the word Salat means link. It literally means Salah, connection. Literally. And the words of Allah that are being recited are what connect us to Him. It's the stretched rope of Allah from the sky to the earth, the Qur'an itself. The more connected you are to the Qur'an, the more connected you are to Allah. The more disconnected you are from the Qur'an, the more disconnected you are from Allah. That's a fact. You have to be, and I have to be on a life mission to get closer to this book. And nobody can say that they're close to the Qur'an. Nobody. This is an ocean that doesn't have an end. I can't say, Alhamdulillah, this, this talk is for you, it's not for me. It's actually more for me than it is for you. So, Because the deeper you go, you realize, I don't know anything. I need to go more, I need more, I need more, I need more. Now the ayah of dua. Subhanallah, every word of this ayah. We begin with the word idha. Idha is trans, wa idha sa'alaka ibadi, right? So it begins with idha. Idha means in English, when. When. There's a difference in English and in Arabic between when and if. I want you to understand the difference between when and if. In Arabic, we say in. In. وَلَمْ يَقُلْ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى وَإِنْ سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي قَالْ وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي So what's the difference between if and when? Let me tell you a story. There's a mother. She sent her, her son joined the army. And he went to war. Now she's missing her son. And she doesn't hear back from him. No calls coming, no emails coming, nothing. He's at war. When you talk to her about her son, does she say, when my son comes back, I will be very happy. Or does she say, if my son comes back, I will be very happy. Which one does she say? She says, when my son comes back, I'll be very happy. She does not say what? If my son comes back, I'll be very happy. Because if she says, if my son comes back, then she has accepted that he will die. If she says when, then she's expecting him to come home. You understand? When you lose someone, and you really want them to come back, and your heart cannot accept that they won't come back, you don't say if, you say when. Allah says, when my slave asks you. He does not say, if my slaves ask you. Why? Because he's not saying, oh, maybe they won't ask. Allah is expecting you to ask. He's waiting for you to ask. It's not just a possibility. It's like Allah is saying, when are you going to ask? Subhanallah, idha. It's a, there's a tawakku, there's an expectation, there's a talab, there's a love inside the word idha. If Allah was talking about people, He didn't care about them. Whether they ask or not, who cares? He would have said, in sa'ala. He said, idha sa'ala. Then there's sa'ala itself, sa'ala fi'il madi. You can say, idha yas'alu also. Ida yutla alayhim. Ida comes with mudari, ida comes with madi. Ida comes with the present tense and it comes with the past tense. When it comes with the present tense, it means over and over again. Meaning, if my slaves ask you over and over again, that would have been ida yas alka, ida yas aluka, ibadi. But the ayah says ida sa'alaka. Sa'ala is the past tense. The past tense, you shir ila al marra, al marra al wahida, is one time, something that happens one time. Meaning, I'm waiting for my slave, if they, they can only ask about me how many times? Once, I'm not even waiting for a lot of times, I'm expecting just one time ask. Then he says, Sa'alaka, they ask you, Ya'ni Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah is waiting, some sahabi says, that I want to know more about Allah. 
Who is he going to go ask? Rasulullah Sa'alaka ibadi And then he didn't say Sa'alaka haula These people Sa'alaka alladhina amanu Those who believe Sa'alaka al-mu'minun The believers Sa'alaka al-muslimun Ashabuk None of these He said Sa'alaka Ida sa'alaka ibadi My slaves My slaves And he didn't even say Ibaduna Or ibadallah He said ibadi The e at the end of that means I My slaves Allah uses my in the Qur'an, my. You know sometimes Allah uses he, sometimes he uses we, sometimes he uses I, right? You know that, right? When does he use I? He only uses I when he has a lot of love or a lot of anger. There's only two times. If you read an ayah of the Qur'an, it has I in it. It's either Allah is showing a lot of love or he is showing a lot of anger. There's only those two. There's no normal situation. This is an ayah of a lot of love. So he says, Ibadi, not Ibaduna. My slaves, they're mine. You know, even when, you, when someone is distant from you, but they're yours, my brother, my sister, my mother, my father. There's an, it's, not, it's not just you own them, you love them. When you say my to someone, it's an expression of love. And they're Ibad. Now these people may not be worshipping Allah, but he still calls them Ibad. Now, who do they ask? Let me ask you if you were paying attention. The people who ask about Allah, do they ask Allah or do they ask the Prophet? They ask the Prophet. They ask the Prophet So what you expect is, now hey, I'll say the English. If they ask you about me, then tell them, I'm near. But the ayah does not say tell them. Ayah does not say tell them. Here's what the ayah says. When they ask you about me, then I am near. Then I am near. What is missing? Then tell them, I فَقُلْ لَهُمْ إِنِّي قَرِيبٌ There's no فَقُلْ لَهُمْ There's no tell them. Why not? The people came to ask the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Somebody comes to ask the alim about Allah. Will Allah answer my dua? I have a lot of mistakes. I missed a lot of salat. Will Allah still answer my dua? Will Allah, will Allah put me in hellfire? He's asking the alim. In this case, he's asking Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah says, he puts the Rasul aside and he answers him directly. He starts talking to you and talking to me. He's not talking to Rasulullah anymore. He says, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ I am near. I am so near, I'll talk to you. I won't even tell the messenger to talk to you. I'll talk to you myself. That's the beauty of Qur'an. People came and asked Rasulullah wasallam, And Allah did not tell him, you go tell them. Allah said, no, no, I'll tell them myself. I am so near. You don't believe me? Why, and why did I say you don't believe me? He said, inni. Inna is used in Arabic, li izalat al shak. You know, al mukhatib mutaraddid, the huraib. So if someone is in doubt, then you use inna. Allah is saying, don't you ever doubt that I am near. Why are you doubting that I am near? Why do you think I would go away from you? You turn your back on me. I don't turn my back on you. You turned your back on me. You disobeyed me. You stop loving me. I never stop loving you. You become distant. I stay near. And the word qareeb also. Qareeb is some sifa, which means I'm always near. The sentence actually means, certainly I am always near. Let my slaves know. Now, the other thing is, how many names does Allah have? 99. At least 99. At least 99. So many beautiful names of Allah. And the one, when Allah, and, some, and the messenger is told, when people ask, you about me. When they ask the Prophet about Allah, then the most important thing you need to tell them is which name of Allah or which description that He is what? Near. That He is near. Why? Because when He is near, it's easier for you to talk to Him. When, you, when someone is far, you can't talk to them. When someone is near, you can talk to them. When someone is near, you can respect them. Listen. Kids, uh, you guys, how many kids in school here? Kids from school? Okay, like four kids, excellent. Okay, what do the rest of you do? Okay, anyway, anyway. So if you're in school, and the teacher walks out of the classroom, the teacher walks out of the classroom, do you behave the same way or no? No. And don't lie, you're in the masjid, okay? <laughs> Go outside and lie. Hey, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> when the teacher is near, do you behave differently? You do, don't you? Now you're taking a test. The teacher walks by. 
He just walks by. Do you cover your exam a little more? You know? Just his shadow makes you like, oh, 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 oh my God. Especially if he puts his hand on your desk and he looks down at your paper and he goes, hmm. Oh, I do that to my students because I really enjoy torturing them psychologically. This is one of the great joys of teaching. You get to mess with students. Oh my God. Allah says, if my slaves ask you about me, tell them I am what? Near. When you know someone is near, you act differently. When you know the police officer is near, you act differently. When you know your boss is near, you act differently. When you know the teacher is near, you act differently. When you know your mother is there, you talk differently to your friends. When she goes to the other room, then you elbow them in the face or whatever. But when she's there, you talk differently. When you realize Allah is near, you will become different forever. Because He's always near. فَإِنِّي قَرِيب Now, if He's so near, then what does He say? Ujibu. Ujibu. Ujibu in Arabic means to, ajaba means to respond, to give an answer. But there's another word in Arabic, which is istajaba. كَمَا يَقُولُ الْقُرْآنَ فِي مَوْضِعْ آخَرْ فَاسْتَجَابَ لَهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ فَاسْتَجَابَ لَهُمْ لَمْ يَقُولْ أَجَابَ لَهُمْ قَالْ فَاسْتَجَابَ لَهُمْ He said he responded to them, their master responded to them. So there are two words in Arabic, ajaba and istajaba. There's ajaba and istajaba. Now ajaba from if'al is actually immediate. When you answer somebody immediately without any delays, that is called ijaba. When you take time to answer, you don't answer right away, but you answer over time, that is called istijaba. Allah says, ujibu. He says, I respond when? Immediately. I respond immediately. Some people make dua and they say, when is Allah going to respond? When is the help of Allah coming? I'm sick, when is Allah going to make me better? I can't find a job, when is Allah going to give me a, jo gonna give me a job? You know, I can't get married, when is Allah going to get me married? My mother keeps turning all the rishtas down. When is Allah going to change her heart? This one's nose is too long, this one's eyes are too far apart, this one is, you know, this one doesn't know how to make chai properly. I can't get married, my mother is killing everything. Ya Allah, when is my mother going to, you make dua to Allah. Allah says, I will respond when? Immediately. And by the way, by the way, these are the ayat of Ramadan, yes? So if you really, really want immediate answers, when do you make dua? Ramadan, man. And if you really want Allah to be close, get close to Allah first, recite a lot of Qur'an and then make dua. Then recite Qur'an and make dua. Then recite Qur'an and make dua. That's what you should do in Ramadan. Oh man, you'll enjoy Ramadan. If you make lots of dua, you start enjoying Ramadan. If you don't make lots of dua, you won't enjoy Ramadan. The joy of Ramadan is in dua. So he says, ujibu. I respond. Then he says, da'i. Such powerful words. He says, I, by the way, I is used when? When did I say? I is I and we and he. When is I used? Too much love, too much anger. Which one is this? Too much love. I respond. I myself respond. Immediately respond. Now respond to who? You might think Allah responds to someone who makes a lot of dua. I only make dua like once in a year. When you have exams, Ya Allah, I have an exam. Ameen. And then you take the dua. <laughs> you know, or you make dua if you know you cut the red light and you're about to get the 5,000 rial ticket. You're like, Ya Allah. Get the angel between me and the, cam the license plate and the camera. Don't let me get the text message, the SMS. Anything but the SMS, SMS, you know? Then you remember Allah. Allah now, if, you, if someone makes a lot of dua, you use the word dua. If someone makes dua one time, just one time, you call that da'watun. Da'wa with the tamar buta at the end. The tamar buta is it's used for mustar marra. It's used for the words in Arabic that happen one time. Like darb means hitting, but darbatun means one time hit. Akil means food, but aklatun is a single meal. The tamar buta makes it one time. Allah says da'wat ad da'i. I respond to even the one call. The guy only made dua how many times? One time. Allah does not say to him, where were you all year? You never made any salah. You only make one dua to me your whole life? Forget you. You only remember me one time? You know, if you are an employee, and you only show up to your job one time in the whole year. You don't have a job. They'll say, who are you? I work here. What? When? I got my job last year. What are you doing here? Well, I, you know, I, I, I was, uh, I don't know, but I'm here now at least. 
Can we start all over again? Is your boss going to say, yeah, sure. I'll, right away, sir, please. Why don't you get a promotion? <laughs> no. He's not going to offer you that. Allah is giving you, in the word da'wah, He's saying, I will even answer the person who never makes du'a, only made du'a. One time, even they should say, Ya Allah, He will answer. Don't say to yourself, man, I don't even have a beard, Allah is not going to answer my du'a. I only have a mustache, Allah is going to, you know. I just watched like three movies before Ramadan, because I figured I'm not going to watch in Ramadan. Now I'm going to make du'a, Ya Allah will still answer your du'a. Don't watch movies. But don't expect, never think Allah will not answer. Even the guy who makes one du'a. Now you say, okay, okay, the guy made one du'a, but maybe it's a really good guy. Maybe it's like a salih, a mu'min, someone who has a lot of taqwa, someone who has a lot of ilm, or maybe a guy who made tawbah. Ujibu da'watat ta'ibi. I respond to the du'a of the guy who made tawbah. He didn't say that. He said, I respond to the, guy, the da'wa, the one du'a of the guy who called, ad-da'a, the one who called. The description of the guy is that he did what? He called. In other words, did Allah put any other expectation on him? Did he say, Da'wat al Musalli, Da'wat al Muttaqi, Da'wat al Mu'min? No. He didn't say you have to have taqwa, he didn't say you have to have iman, he didn't say you have to have ilm. Not in this du'a. Not in this du'a. Why? Because Allah is talking to people who are so far away from Allah. And the first thing he tells them is, Look, I am near. You're far, I am near. And then he tells them, look, I know you have nothing but this one dua right now. That's okay, just give me. Just give me this one dua. Even if you're just a da, you're just a caller. You're, I have no other description for you. I can't even call you salih yet, Muslim yet, mu'min yet. I can't call you anything. I'm just calling you a da, the caller. That's not even a qualification. Just that is good enough. Just call me. Subhanallah. What an invitation from Allah. And before I go on, I told you sometimes a boss has 500 employees. Does he know their names? No. Especially if the employee only sent him in his entire life, only sent him how many emails? One email. How's he going to remember? If he sends him a text message, he doesn't have his name saved, he doesn't know where this number came from. Allah did not say, Ujibu da'wata da'in. He said, Ujibu da'wata ad-da'i. The alif lam in the word makes it ma'rifah, which means it makes it proper, specific. In other words, anybody who calls Allah, Allah does not just say, someone who calls me, He goes, that one who called me. That one in particular. He is, you are specific to Allah. Allah knows you especially, personally. No doctor remembers your name. If he sees a hundred patients a day, he doesn't know your name. He just tries his luck. He goes, Muhammad, how are you? Come on. You know, <laughs> everybody's Muhammad. You know, chances are. You know, he doesn't know you by name. You know, I meet people, wallahi, I meet people. I was in Baltimore, this elderly fellow came to me, this uncle came to me, he goes, Beta, how are you? I remember when you were so little, you used to run around in the masjid. I was like, I'm from Texas, man. Uh, but I said, yes, I remember too. And I just, you know, <laughs> no make a few. They don't remember. People don't remember. Allah Azza wa Jal even knows you in particular. You might say, how is the CEO of the company going to know my name? I'm just a security guard. He is so high, I am so low, how will he know my name? How will the president of a country know one citizen? How is that possible? How will I know if you, all of you came up to me and told me your names, will I remember? I don't know. I don't know. If some of you got my phone number, please don't take my phone number, but if you got my phone number and you sent me an SMS, I don't have your number saved, do I know who it is? I don't know who it is, I just have a number, I don't have a name of nothing. You call Allah, Allah knows who exactly you are. And He wants to answer you immediately. He wants to start a new relationship with you immediately. Whatever happened yesterday is done. Start today. You become Muslim today. You become a caller to Allah today. Ujibu da'wat ad da'i. Now the question I told you before was, the problem I gave you before was, if you want to meet someone important, that happens on your schedule or my or the important person's schedule? Important person's schedule. You don't say, I would like to meet the Minister of Education. Let me just, you know, walk over to the ministry and say, hey, let's go. I want to talk to you for a minute. I can't do, I, I'm not going to fly to DC and say, I need to have a pizza slice with Obama. I'm not going to do that. You can't just go and walk up to the president. 
I can't even, if you're an employee, like if somebody works at Microsoft back in the day, when Bill Gates was still the Amir of Microsoft, they're not going to say, hey, Bill, you want to go grab some pizza or something? They're not going to do that. They don't have time. He doesn't have time for you. When will Allah, when can you, what's a good time to call Allah? People say, what's a good time to make dua? People say that, right? And of course, we're talking about Ramadan. What does he say though? He says, Ujibu da'wat al da'i idha, whenever. Whenever, da'ani, whenever he called me. Whenever you call me, I will answer you immediately. Call me one in the morning, I'll answer you. Call me in the afternoon, I'll answer you. Before you go to sleep, you call me, I'll answer you. SubhanAllah. This is not the whole ayah. This is the first half of the ayah. I will answer you whenever you call. This is the invitation of Allah. How is it that we don't listen to this invitation? How can a person stay away from dua after listening to the word of Allah? I don't understand, you know. Then he says, now I've given you my invitation. My invitation is I'm near to you, I'm ready to listen to you whenever. Even if you haven't made dua except only one time, I'll still listen to you. Doesn't matter if you have no other good Islamic qualities except dua, I'll still listen to you. What should you do though? This is what Allah is doing for you. What should you do for Him? He says, فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُونِ The other word, remember there was ajaba and istijaba. Istijaba also means to try to answer. Somebody says, brother, I want to have lunch with you. I say, I'll try to make time. I don't know if I can do it, I'll try. Trying means maybe you will succeed, maybe you will fail. Allah says, فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُونِ They should at least try to answer me. You are asking things from me, Allah says. You're asking me for a better job. You're asking me for health. You're asking me to protect your children. You're asking me for your parents. You're asking me for a house. You're asking me for all kinds of things. I'm asking you some things too. What about what I'm asking you? فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا Then they should respond to me. They should respond to me. Now the, the thing is, in the Fatiha, in Surah Al-Fatiha, what do we want from Allah in Surah Al-Fatiha? Anybody know? We want guidance. But what does Allah want from us, Ibadah? Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. Nasta'in means we want help. But before we ask Allah what we want, we tell Allah what we will do for Him. What will we do for Him? Iyaka na'budu. What will He do for us? Isti'ana. He'll help us. So what you do for Allah should come first. What you want for yourself should come second. But in these ayat of Ramadan, He said, I will answer you whenever you call me. And then He said, you should answer me. He didn't say, you should answer me, then I will answer you. SubhanAllah. He even put Himself second, and you and me first in these ayat. He put Himself second. فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي They should respond to me. They should have real iman in me. They should really believe in me. لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ So that they can be set straight. So they can be good people. They can change themselves. SubhanAllah, these few ayat of Ramadan are transformative. They can completely change the way you think about this month. If we reflect just on these ayat, the relationship you are going to have with the Qur'an, the relationship you're going to have with dua, the relationship you will have with Allah after Ramadan is done. These are the things you have to internalize. Now as I conclude with you guys, I want to give you, at the end I'll give you some practical things, but today, today inshallah at least, I want to give you some observations, the things that you have to look out for. The thing we want out of Ramadan, for the goal of fasting is taqwa. The goal of fasting is taqwa. The goal of Ramadan is three things. To complete the 30 day training, to declare the greatness of Allah and to be grateful. Three goals of Ramadan itself. But now I want to tell you what the real threat to your taqwa is in countries like the one you live in. Like Qatar, like Dubai, like the Khalij, like the, much of the Arab world, much of the Muslim world. The big danger to you and to your children is materialism. That is the big danger. Your children and you are becoming obsessed with the car, with the brand name clothes, with the brand name phone, with the gadgets, with the new movie, with the new song download, 
this is, with, you know, with the hanging out at the mall, with Facebook, and how many likes you got on your comment. You're getting obsessed with these things. Your entire life only means these things, nothing else. And this is a tragedy. Because the youth of this ummah are so powerful. Wallahi, they are so powerful. When the young people of this ummah internalize the Qur'an, they can change the world. Really. The world will be a beautiful place if this, the young people of this ummah wake up. But the young people of this ummah are being put to sleep by the iPhone 5, by the Samsung Galaxy Touch, by the iPad, by Facebook. And those things can be used for a lot of good. They can be used for a lot of good, but man, those things are poison too, man. They're poison too. The sword is good if you point it at the enemy, but it's pretty bad if you point it at yourself. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what it is. These tools, they, they are a force of good. They can be. I am on Facebook, you know how much? Never. My pictures on Facebook, some things I say are on Facebook, I am actually almost never on Facebook. Never. I'll tweet things once in a while. I'll send a tweet message. I never check what responses there are. People say, brother, you never respond to your, respond to your Twitter. I say, I'm leaving a sunnah. Don't worry, but say something good that will benefit somebody else. Right? And then don't worry about, don't get caught up in online conversations. You have more important conversations. How you have time for all those conversations, man? How you have time to read all the comments under a YouTube video? Where did you find the time? I mean, where did you find the time? I, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked. So you have to, you and I have to detox. We have to get rid of the gadgets, especially in Ramadan, guys. Get rid of the gadgets. Delete the video games on your, delete the game apps off your phone. Delete them. For Ramadan, you say, yeah, at least I can re-download them later. I don't care. But at least in Ramadan. Every, sisters too. I'm, sister, get off of Facebook right now. I see you. I don't see you, but you just got off of Facebook. And the joke is on you. But anyway, you know, get off of your devices. You have to do this. Ma materialism is killing us. And I tell you the real anecdote, the real solution to materialism is understanding the Book of Allah. Personally. Personally understanding the Book of Allah. The more you start understanding the Book of Allah for yourself, you will no longer be interested in materialism. It will not fulfill you. It will leave you empty. This will start giving you joy that you never felt before. You get to talk to Allah, man. You get to talk to Allah when you, talk, when you recite Quran. What more can you ask for? So this is the, this, some practical, or some advice I want to give you, or the warning I want to give uh, you guys in particular. And of course, materialism is hitting everywhere. But I noticed like the malls and like the, you know, the, the glitz and everybody's like, the youth are like flocking towards these things. I don't get angry at them. I just feel like we haven't given them Quran. We haven't given them something to be excited about. It's our fault, you know. Now the last piece, especially for the parents that are in the audience. Here's how you can make good use of your Ramadan. Everyone here should have some goals in Ramadan. Here's my recommendation. My recommendation is you should memorize a couple of short surahs. Short, short surah means a page, a page and a half. A couple, maybe four of them if you can. Three, you know, two, between two and four of them in the month of Ramadan. And you should not do it alone. You should do it with your family. You do it, your children do it, the husband does it, the wife does it, first one to do it gets 200 riyals. Now the father will do it very quickly. Okay, so... But do it. Memorize Qur'an as a family. Memorize Qur'an as a family. Make it a family project. We're all going to memorize the surah. It's a beautiful thing when a family gets together to get closer to Allah's book. My recommendation is uh, the musabbihat. Like if you memorize Surah Al-Jumu'ah, Surah Al-Munafiqun, Surah Al-Taghabun, these surahs, at least these three surahs, beautiful surahs. And they really help your iman. The next thing you want to do, this is again in Ramadan, my recommendation is to actually listen to durus of those same surahs that you've memorized. Listen to lectures and explanations of the same surahs that you memorized. Now the surahs I recommended to you were surahs number 62, 63, and 64. Those are the numbers of the surahs. I picked those surahs on purpose because those three surahs 
are about a Muslim ummah that is losing its iman. And Allah is fixing their iman again. That's what those three surahs are about. An ummah whose iman is becoming weak, and Allah makes it strong again. And He protects it from hypocrisy. And He shows them the fruits of real iman. Right? So that's why those surahs are very particularly beautiful and easy to memorize also. Okay? What surahs were they? See if you're paying attention. 62, 63, and 64. Now, what you can, I don't recommend doing other studies in Ramadan. Like, you know, I, I personally am a big believer in Arabic studies and other studies, but those aren't spiritual studies. They're ulum aliyah, right? They're tools to get to higher studies. You can put the academic studies aside in Ramadan. The only thing you should study in Ramadan is what gives, gets you closer to Allah directly, immediately. So if you're an Arabic student, don't do Arabic studies in Ramadan. Do Quran studies in Ramadan. Do tafsir studies in Ramadan. Don't do Arabic studies in Ramadan, okay? Or if you're a Tajweed student, don't study Tajweed in Ramadan, memorize more Qur'an. You understand? Now, I have, uh, there's a project I'm working on that I have basically dedicated my entire life to at this point. And the project, the goal of this project is to do only two things. I believe every Muslim in the world who can speak English at least, every Muslim who can speak and understand English should have access to learn the language of the Qur'an. Not, not just at a beginner level, but at a very advanced level. That's my belief, that every Muslim, it should be available to them. And the second is that every Muslim should have the opportunity to listen to an explanation of the Qur'an. Not read. But what did I say? Listen. Why is that important? Because when you listen to something, you remember. And when you read something, what happens? You forget. I remember the speeches I heard 10 years ago. I don't remember the articles I read 10 years ago. I don't even remember the article I read this morning. But I remember the speeches. When Quran is presented as a speech, you tend to what? You tend to remember. When you go home and read the ayat of fasting today, you'll remember a lot of things I said. Because you were listening. If I gave you a printout of my speech and you read it, guess what would happen? You wouldn't remember. If we want the ummah to get closer to the Quran, we have to make the explanation of the Qur'an available in video and in audio so they can listen and then remember. That is a mission. That's a mission by itself. Alhamdulillah, the first phase of that mission is complete. I, was, I started a tafsir or a basic tafsir project of the Qur'an where I was going to do an, a translation of the Qur'an and explain it in easy language so that the entire family can listen and learn something about the Book of Allah ayah by ayah by ayah. It's, it was called the cover to cover project. It's done, alhamdulillah, and it's all posted online. I told you to, to try to memorize surahs number 62, 63, and 64. Then what I would like you to do is go to the website, listen to durus of Saf, or sorry, Jumu'ah, Munafiqoon, and Taghabun, these three surahs, the lectures on those surahs are already up online. Listen to them two, three, four times. Until the message of those surahs gets inside your head. It's inside your head. And next time you stand in Salat and you recite those surahs, you have a real Salat. You are really connected with Allah because you memorized the ayat and you understood what they mean. At least some things from what they mean is inside you and inside your whole family. So when you're at home and sometimes you didn't come to the masjid for some reason and you're leading Salat at home and you're reciting the surah, your whole family understands. Your whole family has khushu' in that Salat, you know? That's what I want you to reach. So the website for that is bayina.tv. If you don't know how to spell bayina, it's a hard spelling, so I'll spell it out for you. It's B-A, take your cell phones out so you can put it in. I know you have cell phones, come on, don't be playing me. Seriously. And then after I'm done telling you this, I'll talk about marriage. No, I won't, but that guy just woke up. <laughs> what? Marriage? <laughs> Subhanallah. <laughs> Gotcha. Anyway, uh, the, the website is bayina.tv, B-A-Y-Y, two Y's, B-A-Y-Y-I-N-A-H, dot TV. If you can check out the durus on Surah Al-Jumu'ah, Munafiqun and Taghabun, I think you'll benefit from that, inshallah ta'ala, tremendously. Bi'idhnillah. Okay? I hope you guys benefited from the, the conversation today about Ramadan. I pray that Allah accepts all of our Ramadan. Make dua that I have a safe journey back, inshallah, as I leave, and I'll be making lots of dua for you and your community. بارك الله لي ولكم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله